Welcome to the Peace Hub at the Rise for Climate, Jobs and Justice here in Portland, Maine. We're in Lincoln Park. It's Saturday, September 8th. We're very happy to be here to help bring the message that the Pentagon is the biggest polluting organization on the earth and that if we're talking about climate change without talking about the military, then we aren't really talking about stopping climate change. I'm Lisa Savage. I'm an organizer with the Maine Natural Guard. Uh, we draw the connection between the Pentagon and climate change. And I'm going to share a few remarks today that I did not write. They are from an amazing article by Stacy Bannerman that was in Common Dreams um, uh, July 31st, and I'm just going to read a few excerpts from Stacy's article because I don't really feel I could do better than she did at representing the problem that we are faced with. We haven't counted the massive carbon footprint of America's endless wars because military emissions abroad have a blanket exemption from both national reporting requirements and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But there will be no exemptions in the coming climate collapse. We've all got skin in the war game now. This is from her article, Is Climate the Worst Casualty of War? She goes on to say, research published in the Journal of Pediatrics says children are estimated to bear 88% of the burden of disease related to climate change. We have some children here today that may have some uh, thoughts on that problem. The Pentagon uses more petroleum per day than the aggregate consumption of 175 countries. That's out of 210 in the world. And the Pentagon generates more than 70% of this nation's total greenhouse gas emissions. That is based on rankings in the CIA World Facebook uh, Factbook. The US Air Force burns through 2.4 billion gallons of jet fuel a year all of it derived from oil, as reported in Scientific American. Since the start of the post 9-11 wars, the US military's fuel consumption has averaged about 114 million barrels a year. And that figure does not even include fuel used by coalition forces, military contractors, or the massive amount of fossil fuels that are burned in weapons manufacturing. Just speaking about the Iraq war, it is estimated that it has generated upwards of 400 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. So the war and the long occupation that still has not ended. We've got to wind farms to build and pipelines to stop. We've got solar panels to install and water to protect, but to do so while continuing to feed the fossil-fueled military beast, chewing up nearly 60% of the national budget is energy inefficient and environmentally self-defeating. We cannot cure this man-made cancer on the climate without addressing the underlying causes. In order to achieve the massive systemic and cultural transformations required for managing climate change and advancing climate justice, we're going to have to deal with the socially sanctioned, institutionalized violence perpetrated by US foreign policy that is pouring fuel on the fire of global warming. The Department of Defense has the largest carbon footprint of any enterprise on this planet. We have to replace the flawed patriotism desperately clinging to the idea that we can't win without war when all evidence is to the contrary. We need a bipartisan paradigm so powerfully devoted to the liberty and justice and freedom for all that creating an intelligent and muscular peace becomes a national priority. If we do not, we will never be the America that we have said we are. In the end, it's what we haven't included in the cost of war that is ending up costing us so, the most. We simply cannot continue on the path we're on. The wars are the most unsustainable policy on this nation's books at this point. We have to defrock the sacred cow grazing at the Pentagon because climate may be the worst casualty of all. We have to keep working to keep it in the ground. But if we don't get serious about stopping the United States war machine, we could lose the biggest battle of our lives. Thank you.
Those are the words of Stacy Bannerman in Common Dreams. I wish I had wrote no, written those remarks, but I'm happy to share them. I do have a copy of the full article that I'd love to share with you later. Now we are going to hear from uh, probably the person that's come the farthest to be with us here at the Peace Hub, and that is Tarek Koff. He's come from New York State. He's brought these amazing banners with him that we're happy to carry in today's parade. And he has a song for us and some remarks, so I'm going to hand the microphone over to Tarek. Here you go. Listen carefully. Our country is in the dark grip of idiocy. For thee I sing. Land where the racist strives, land where the president lies, while our gentle planet dies, let resistance ring. Let resistance ring. These are mine. My name's Tara Calv. I'm with Veterans for Peace. I was on the board of directors of Veterans for Peace for six years. Bruce and I have done a lot of things together, delegations to Jeju Island and Okinawa with other veterans. And uh, when Bruce asked me to come up, I had to do it. The U.S. military is responsible for the most egregious and widespread pollution on this planet. This information goes almost entirely unreported in the media. The global environmental impact of the U.S. military is largely unaddressed also by environmental organizations. This has to change. This impact that the military has includes uninhibited use of fossil fuels, massive creation of greenhouse gases, an extensive release of radiation and chemicals contaminants into the air, water, and our soil. The Pentagon is the largest institutional user of petroleum products and energy in general. Yet the Pentagon has a blanket exemption in all international climate agreements. So what does that tell us? Our demand has to be greater. The U.S. military has over 800 bases in foreign countries. 73 years after World War II and 65 years after the Korean War, there are still 174 U.S. base sites in Germany, 113 in Japan, and 83 in South Korea, according to the Pentagon. Hundreds more dot the planet in around 80 countries. We're talking about an empire. We're talking about a very destructive empire to this planet. The Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense is, the, is, again, the world's largest polluter, producing more hazardous waste than the five largest U.S. chemical companies combined. The Department of Defense has left its toxic legacy throughout the world in the form of depleted uranium. I'm assuming that people know what that is. It was used in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and it's really bad. And our soldiers, as well as the people who live there, will be affected by depleted uranium for generations upon generations. The children and the grandchildren will be affected by it, and they are now. The toxic legacy includes uh, Oil, jet fuel, which is worse than regular fuel in terms of the toxicity, pesticides, defoliants like Agent Orange, and lead, among others. So, you know about Agent Orange. If you're, if you're my age, you know about it. Agent Orange was used extensively in, in Vietnam. Millions of people in Vietnam are suffering still from Agent Orange. Babies are born deformed, without limbs, without fingers, twisted, hardly able to move. It's absolutely horrible, still today. And our veterans that have come back from Vietnam, many of them are suffering from Agent Orange-related diseases and their children, and I know this personally. U.S. military bases topped the Superfund list 
of the most polluted places as deadly compounds like perchlorate and trichloroethylene seep into the drinking water aquifers and soil. Nuclear weapons testing in the American Southwest and the South Pacific Islands has contaminated millions of acres of land and water with radiation, while uranium tailings defile Navajo reservations. But it's not only Navajo res reservations. I've been out there. There are over, well over 10,000, get this, abandoned uranium mines that are still open pit, that are releasing uh, radiation into the water and the air and the soil. So that affects all of us, not just the Navajos, which is bad enough as it is. Okay, is the U.S. military protecting freedom and democracy, or is it ensuring corporate capitalism's pollution, environmental degradation for profit, and expansion into every corner of the earth? Now, I just want to read you a direct quote from Major General Smedley Butler, who won two Congressional Medals of Honor, which I think he should have thrown away, like other vets have done since the wars. But this is what he said after getting out. He said, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service. And during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. That right there tells you about what our military is doing and why they do it. And I'm saying this as a veteran, and many of my veteran friends will say the same thing. So here in Maine, you have Bath Iron Works, a subsidiary of General Dynamics, which was asking the state of Maine for 60 million and wound up getting thir and wound up getting $45 million from the state of Maine. This is a state with children, 43,000 children living in poverty, and, and a state that has a dire need of resources. And they're taking this wealthy country, this multi-billion dollar corporation, General Dynamics, is taking $45 million from this state. There's no excuse for it. This is, we can call it what it is, greed-oriented, Corporate gangsterism, that's what it is. So Bath Iron Works could be building offshore windmills to bring sustainable energy to the people of Maine instead of warships that are going to add to the danger and the, war po and the pollution of the planet. We need to address the two major threats to our survival and realize that these two threats are inseparably connected. In, in 2017, the annual Pentagon budget plus war budget, plus nuclear weapons in the Department of Energy, plus Homeland Security and other military spending was well over $1 trillion. Think about that for a minute. So then think about this. 1% of U.S. military spending could end the lack of clean drinking water on Earth. 1% could do that. 3% and you could check these facts out. 3% of that could end world hunger. 22% could end extreme poverty globally. And most significant to us gathered here, something like 20% of that obscene war budget could begin to make huge inroads into addressing the climate crisis. This is not even, we're not even talking about half of the military budget to be used to save this planet and to address things like hunger and water shortage and all of that. We gotta think about that and we gotta demand that these things happen. So what does it all mean? Wrapping up, it means that there's an elephant in the room that has to be recognized and addressed. The climate change movement and the anti-war peace and justice movement cannot be separate. We have one issue with two components. Stop the wars, stop the warming. Yeah. Thank you. Let's do it. Good job, Tarek. My name is Bruce Gagnon, I live in Bath. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace. I'm a 
veteran from the uh, time of the Vietnam War. I was in the Air Force. I've been working uh, in the peace movement for many, many years now. And one of the issues that I've been most uh, working on is conversion of the military industrial complex. And because I live in Bath, and I remember that slogan, think globally, act locally, I say to myself, what is the best thing that I can do living in Bath, Maine? Well, it's to call attention to what uh, Tarek and Lisa before him said, that the military is the biggest polluter on the planet, that the Pentagon has the largest carbon boot, boot print on the entire planet. And so thus, if I really want to contribute to dealing with climate change, one thing that I can do is work for the conversion of Bath Ironworks, to move away from building warships that contribute to climate change and to chaos around the world, wars for oil, wars for fossil fuel control. So maybe if they were building at Bath Ironworks rail systems up and down the state of Maine, offshore wind turbines, we have the largest uh, capacity of wind in the entire United States in the Gulf of Maine, tidal power systems and other kind of sustainable technologies at Bath Ironworks. And the interesting thing is, is that UMass Amherst in the economics department and at Brown University in Rhode Island, for years they've been doing studies that show that conversion of a place like Bath Ironworks to sustainable technology development creates many more jobs. And all the politicians in every election year run around saying that, well, my God, we've got to create more jobs. We've got to bring more jobs. Well, here's the best way to do it. Convert the military industrial complex. You solve for peace. You solve for climate change. You solve for jobs and social justice. It's labor unions benefit. It's a win, win, win for everybody. So then why isn't there a coalition of peace groups, environmental groups, labor and social justice groups working on this demand to convert the military industrial complex, which benefits the effort to deal with climate change? Why is that not happening? Party politics. Party politics. I would submit that if you ever go to a christening at Bath Ironworks, you'll see both Republicans and Democrats on their bended knees, pledging their total subservience to the constant funding of the war machine. And the fact of the matter is, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they're lined up with their hands out in Congress in Washington, begging for more money to continue this same program when instead they should be going to Washington and saying, you know what, the time has come for us to seriously deal with the climate change issue. We need uh, the funds that are now being wasted on more warships at Bath Ironworks. We need to be converting that facility and building rail and solar and wind and, and tidal power systems to really put a dent in the enormous carbon blueprint created by the military industrial complex. We should be demanding that collectively. Otherwise, friends, we're not going anywhere but down. Can't we see that? And so this is the work we're doing at Bath Ironworks. And we're asking and inviting all of you to begin to think about making this connection. We're not saying drop what you're doing and come and deal, uh, work with us, but begin to integrate the conversion message into your existing climate change work. Begin to talk about how the military is the biggest polluter on the planet. And until we convert the military industrial complex, we're not really gonna solve the problem of climate change. On October 6th at 11.30 a.m., we'll have a protest on Washington Street in front of the administration building in Bath 
talking about these very issues. We invite you to come Saturday, October 6th, and be with us. And at the next at the next christening that is anticipated to happen at BIW sometime before the end of this year, we have 50 people signed up who are going to do nonviolent civil disobedience at the time of the christening, making this whole point that we need to be converting the war machine, we need to be converting the manifestation of uh, the problem in our own state, in our own community. We can't keep ignoring the elephant in the middle of the room. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bruce, Thank you, Bruce and Tarek. Excellent. We're just going to hear very briefly from my granddaughter, Gigi, and her mom, Celine Spivak. Hi. Um, we're here to support the message uh, that has been shared from uh, Bruce and veterans from for peace and natural guard uh, we're really concerned about uh, our earth and what it's going to be like when she is older and I want her to inherit a world where she can hopefully uh, live in, in peace and happiness and I'm not so sure with the way things are going if that's the way things are going to turn out but hopefully with our work um, it will thank you Thank you, Celine. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I think that the march is about to start, and the Peace Hub is going to be marching with everyone else. So um, it's great to see everyone here, and um, let's take it to the streets, Portland. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>